Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, back with you broadcasting live from the Dahl Simons Family Studio, joined, of course, by my close friend and colleague, Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Hawkeye, Doc Hawk, and a thousand other terms. Yeah. So, some not as enduring as others. No. <laughs> we are here this morning to talk again about all things COVID um, and to try and help us understand all the importance of the basic pillars of infection control, which continue to travel with you wherever you go, whatever meeting you may be in, to whatever room you're in, to whatever city you're in, town you're in, gas station you're in, grocery store you're in, the pillars of infection control are right there with you. So this morning, we're going to be spending a lot of time, I think, on mask wearing and just mm -hmm. the, the, the basic importance of all of our pillars all together, yeah. Dana. How are we doing today? Uh, you know, we're, we're really doing well in the hospital. I'm happy Yay. about it. The numbers, the total numbers are down. We still have had some admissions, but of course, overall, um, the net has been more discharges this past week. So when we were at that high of 36, 37, we have since come down. The last couple days have been really good. We're at 25 in the hospital, but a half of those, 20, uh, 12 of those are in the ICU, and yeah. three quarters, eight of those are on the ventilator. So that part's a little bit more so concerning. Not, People are still getting really sick. Yep, but we have had discharges again. Our numbers are, are lower than they were, and we're happy about that. So what does that mean? That means people have been discharged home. When can they get back into society is important. The CDC has pretty good guidance on that. Typically, it is 10 days after your symptom onset with no fever for 24 hours without any Tylenol, but also the KDHE will say 72 hours. So any time in there, one to three days without fever, and then an improvement in your symptoms. And people say, well, what's an improvement? Obviously, that's going to be pretty subjective um, for the individual But it's significant patient. improvement. It's not just a little bit of improvement. Right. You've got to be a lot better. So if you come in the hospital, you need oxygen. Let's say you go home, you aren't needing oxygen. That's a significant improvement. And you need to be less short of breath, even when you get Correct. up and move around. Yeah. Yep. So those are, are pretty good um, stipulations and the guidance from the CDC and KDHE as well. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you can go out and have a free-for-all and not do the physical distancing, not do no. the masking, no. not do the hand hygiene? No. Absolutely not. You are still at risk. We don't know the full Actually, implications. Actually, you're more at risk, quite frankly, because if you get sick again, you could become really ill. So just for your own personal protection, yep. good golly, wear a mask. That's not hard. That's, that should not be hard. Absolutely. But you also still could, you know, we think you're not shedding virus, but there's a chance you could be. Right. So by all means, you need to wear a mask. Yeah, and hopefully as we get more information, we will know that. You know, most importantly, will you get more ill or will you have lesser or mild symptoms if you are reinfected? We don't know. We, we think you probably will be. But the other thing is, what is your danger to the rest of society? Are you still able to shed virus? Do you replicate virus? Yes, probably. The best model we have is the, the rhesus macaque, the monkey model that we have looked at. And it shows that after rechallenge, you aren't shedding as much virus. But again, we don't know how that applies to humans. So we still think you are contagious. It's just a matter of how much. So continue to physical distance, continue to wear the masks. And we know from our freezers how much, how important, yes. our freezer videos, how, how important that mask wearing really is. Because it just prevents everything from going away, going out yep. from your face. It's a huge difference maker. Absolutely. It makes that breath cloud pretty minimal. And so I, gosh, I just, I, it, it's hard for me to not think that people are choosing not to wear a mask almost as if it's a statement. It doesn't need to be a statement. No. This is a public health issue. You know, it's funny. There was a really good article this last week. I don't know if it's funny, but it's, it's remarkable. The last week, I don't remember which m m newspaper it was in, but they looked at the pandemic of 1918 and 1919, the influenza one, and they looked at people who wouldn't and wouldn't wear masks. And all the same mm -hmm. stuff about mm -hmm. mask wearing was true then as it is yeah. now. It's uncomfortable with people to want to may wear it. It became a political statement. You don't can't tell me what to do. Okay. But here's what we can tell you. We're not telling you what to do. We're hoping you make a conscious yeah. good choice. Masks do what? Masks don't tell anybody anything more about you than this. You're trying to protect them. You're trying to take care of your community and you're trying to take care of yourself. That's the statement it makes. Anything beyond that, purely extrapolation and imagination. The one thing it does is it tells us you're trying to protect the community you are in wherever you are. And the evidence is incontrovertible, meaning 
You just can't contest it. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. you don't believe it, take a look at our freezer video from yesterday right. or that we showed yesterday because it makes all the difference. And we're actually got, hopefully we're going to make a little fun of this at the end. There's a great cartoon we want to show you here that uh, Logan uh, showed me this morning that, that's, a, that's important. It's got some brilliant new research just published about the nose and not covering your nose. So you gotta, you got to cover both your mouth and nose. We'll try and show and, you this brilliant new research. And you know, what have we seen in countries that have had mask mandates and have gotten their case uh, and percentage positive down? They have reopened schools safely. And not just school districts or small communities, but countries. And so if we can do that and avoid the gatherings, and stop the spread. We can open up schools safely because that is getting closer and closer and those time frames are being pushed back and pushed back. So. You know, I think our freezer video showed yesterday that we create a breath cloud around us. Mm -hmm. And that breath cloud sits there for a little bit of time and then, especially inside a room where there's not a lot of ventilation or a little yep. breeze outside to wipe it away or disperse right. it, and then all you have to do is think, I'm breathing and I'm moving and I take another few steps and somebody walks right through my breath cloud. Well, guess what happens? that's where you get exposed. Yeah. Now, if you have a mask on, look at that video and see where the breath cloud is. Oh wait, there isn't one. And that's what makes a difference. Wearing a mask is about protecting others and if somebody doesn't have a mask on and you do and you walk through their breath cloud, you get some protection from that. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. So not only should you wear a mask because you're taking care of your community and everybody around you, you should wear a mask because you're also taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you're less likely to come in and to the hospital and expose the rest of us. So, yeah. you know, do the right thing. Do the right thing. It's not hard. Do the right thing. Wear a mask. Keep your distance. Wash your hands. Cough and sneeze into your elbow. And if you don't feel good, stay home. Those are the basic pillars. And they really do protect us wherever we go. Yep. Whether we're going to the drift, uh, the driftless area of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. the high mountains of Colorado, mm -hmm. or you're going to the grocery store here in Kansas City, take care of yourself, take care of others, all at the same time. Yeah. All right. So, Jill, there may be some questions out there, and I'm wondering if there are. Let's start with our media. Hey, this is Taylor, 41. Good morning, guys. There. Uh, I wanted to reach out because I got into another Facebook fight, and I look to you guys to help me. Uh, not, I won't say win those, but at least resolve them. Um, if you would again contrast this versus the flu, and talk about the uh, the distinction between severity, lethality, that kind of thing, there's that continues to be a narrative that people will uh, push on Facebook about, and really all kinds of social media and in person about. Is this really worse than the flu? Is this uh, more lethal than the flu? More people die from the flu, et cetera. And if you would just give us another um, kind of comparison between the two, especially as we get close to the flu season starting. Thanks. You bet, Taylor. Happy to help yeah. with that. Well, I think we're, we'll help you win that Facebook fight. Yeah. <laughs> Dana. Yes. There is absolutely no question that yes. coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, is different right. than influenza. Do you want to start yeah. all about cleanup? Absolutely. Up? And I don't know, you know, as, as we get farther into this, it either becomes just a lack of knowledge or it's just a denial. So, number one, on both counts, knowledge about influenza. I mean, yes, we hear about influenza because we've grown up with it. We understand it. But do you really understand about the disease? So it is completely different, wholly different. You know, for the one thing, we do have pretty adequate treatment for influenza, and we have vaccination. So vaccination, people say, I don't want to get the vaccine because it'll give me flu. That's absolutely not true. Um, the vaccine doesn't cause influenza. What it does is reduce your risk of getting um, infected with it and having symptoms, and also progression to critical illness. So we have also seen that the total numbers of flu every year are certainly paled now in comparison to the first few months in the United States alone of influenza, uh, of COVID-19. So they, that is totally, wholly different. Again, we have adequate therapies. A lot of deaths also with influenza occur because of secondary infection, a secondary pneumonia with a bacteria, either typically staph or strep, rather than just having the inflammatory or immune dysregulation that we see with COVID-19. So they are wholly different. You can look at the numbers just from a few months in the United States alone compared to a whole year or a couple seasons even of influenza. Um, and that's kind of where we start. So 
Certainly there's other more science behind that, but that's just kind of the basic knowledge about influenza versus COVID-19. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know how you get this point across anymore. It's yeah. kind of crazy. So saying that influenza, generally speaking, I'm going to come back to that point. Influenza, generally speaking, is just as bad as COVID is like saying the sun comes up in the West. Mm. It is just not true. Right. You can think that it's true, and you may still believe in a flat earth, but I'm going to tell you, you're just wrong. Yeah. You are just wrong. And I've got a whole, we've got a whole lot of patients that you've seen, I've seen, yeah. that will agree with just how wrong you are. And I don't know how to convince people outside maybe some numbers. Now, if somebody wants to argue in your Facebook thing that the flu influenza epidemic of 1917 and 1918 was as bad as COVID, you know what? Okay, well, that's a pretty good fight. We can it's go off to that one. That, that may be true. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about routine, routine influenza. Yeah. And, oh, wait, as you said, Dana, we have therapy for influenza and we have, a, we have a vaccination. Neither of those things are fully true yet about coronavirus. So it's yeah. not the same. Yeah. You know, the number of flu deaths in one year is, is 25,000, and in a, in a really bad year, it may be 40,000. Yeah. How many deaths have we had already? We're yeah. like 150, 160,000. 160, Come on, guys, that's four times more than influenza. It's the same? No, it's not. Yeah. If you think it is, then you're just denying reality, and you think the sun's coming up in the West. And I think just in general, uh, or specifically to our hospital, I'm not sure we've ever had 30 influenza patients in the hospital at one no, time. Not one time. No. So there's, there's 17, 20, we may max out, and, and not, we don't have eight of those on a ventilator Correct. at any one time. I mean, I, I've been an ICU physician here between 1990 <laughs> and when I left the ICU in 2015, so that makes 25 years of doing ICU medicine. I, we did not have, we had some bad flu years. Yeah. There was never anything like this. We never shut down a football season or shut down the baseball season or shut down things. Right. And you say, oh, well, you didn't need to do that. Yeah, we did. Yes, we did. Because have you seen how seriously ill people are from that? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm still not sure we're going to have a successful football season this year in college or uh -huh. high school or pros. And I don't, I don't know. That, I think it's going to be tricky. And we saw what happened when the Miami Marlins decided to go to a bar together. Right? Come on. That is not what influenza does. And if you think it is, right. you just, you just, let's sit down and have a real eye-to-eye, -eye, honest conversation where we're not going to make up the facts. Mm -hmm. and, and when we do that, there's absolutely no question that COVID-19 is worse than the flu. I think there's a lot of, it's more, I think, more denial than rather access to accurate information at this point in time. Yeah. Okay. Well, we hope that helped you win your Facebook war. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Other questions? All right, Jill. Before we go to our list of questions, there's a lot of activity on uh, Facebook around this mass conversation. Can you clarify two things? One of them is they want to know the countries of where the studies of the masks that you're talking about that they work. Yeah. What countries were those studies conducted in? Okay. Gosh, yeah, you know, I have a, a list of references about mass studies. So there are population studies, but also individual studies. One of the seminal papers in the population studies, and I it was looking at countries that instituted mask mandates very early, and a majority of those were the Asian countries versus some of the countries that didn't. I think some of those were some of the European and maybe some of the African countries as well. And that paper did show um, that those countries that did, their rate of infection and their rate of death decreased and was more, significantly uh, less, so it decreased more week by week as the pandemic rolled on compared to the countries that didn't. There are also other individual studies about people wearing masks where they did reduce it. And those studies were done um, in Europe. A lot of them, of course, are gonna be Asia, um, Korea, Japan, those types of countries, because of course they were affected first by it. So they were doing those studies. Um, but we do have a long litany of references. And I know, Jill, you've seen it. And, have forwarded on to a number of different people. So there, there are more and more. In fact, there is a, um, in fact, there's a United States publication. Um, I think it was MMWR, one of the CDC publications, although that was, um, I believe, looking in one of the Asian countries, but it was published in our, um, here in the United States. And one of their tenets was social distancing and mask wearing is what we need to reduce 
I wonder if we spread. can supply that list of references and pop them out on our website. I, you so know what? We'll I will check with the web. Team, and but we can get and them we'll out there. We'll see and we'll get yeah. a plan and we'll let everybody we know. And I think there's probably three or four, five more new articles since that time because that was three weeks ago. So yeah. there's been a lot published since then. I wonder well, after the end of our show, which we have a couple of cool things to show also, um, our program today, we can also pop back our freezer video from yesterday just mm -hmm. to rerun it because, man, yep. that, that's pretty, I think it's. Yeah. It's actually, it really is common sense. The thing I would just point out to you, and I keep, we keep saying that, and we always ask any surgeon who's on the program, so would you wear a mask? Would you ever go mm -hmm. into the operating room and not wear a mask? And the answer is no. And the reason isn't because they're protecting each other or they're worried about what's going to happen to them. They're protecting you. Because when you breathe out, when that breath cloud goes out away from you and into your open wound, you're going to get sick. Mm -hmm. And the rate of surgical infections dropped dramatically by mask wearing. And that's old data. That's not new data. Right. That's 1930s, 1940s or someplace back of there. It's, it's a long time ago. So 100, year old, 100 years ago, and even in 100 years ago in the, in the influenza pandemic, again, people said, wear a mask. And yeah. you know how they, how they did? They made homemade masks. Yeah. So just there's a little common sense involved. There is a lot of scientific proof. There is absolutely yeah. no question that mask wearing yeah. works. I think that was a great question. We're happy to provide the references, and these are references you can look up. A very good search engine to use is called PubMed, and that is where there are peer-reviewed um, medical articles, and that's where all of these have come from. So you can certainly just type in general search terms, and they should be able to pop some of those up. If not, we will try to provide links or at least the references for those articles. And one more mask question yeah. to clarify before we jump into our 10 questions that we pulled from the week. Um, there's a lot of questions, several, about if little kids touch their mask, the teachers are telling parents that's worse than wearing a mask at all. Um, some parents are being told or hearing that mask wearing can suffocate like the little two, three, four-year-olds. What can you speak to this? Yeah, once again, it's like people just don't want to wear a mask, right. and so they invent reasons They're, to not yep. do it, and 100%. then they think, oh, see, this is true. It's like, no, that's not true. Yeah. Or a choking hazard, too. They worry yeah, about it. Being absolutely. A yeah, well, I think, again, we said it under two years old, probably not the right idea, yeah. but uh, beginning around two and three, then it becomes the right idea. Yeah, you know, and I think one of the, the, the first point there was we have always said, you know, we need hand hygiene. We don't want you to manipulate your mask or touch your face. So that's a valid point. But I think in this case, you know, if you can continue to practice hand hygiene in those classrooms, have hand sanitizer available if you're able to. But still, it's not worse. Wearing the mask is going to be more important than Absolutely. the manipulation. Because if you because touch the understand. mask and you touch a surface, the surfaces don't tend to yeah. transmit as well. Right. Plus, touching your finger and waving your finger out does not put the germ into the air. It's your breath cloud that puts it into the air, and that's where the communication of the disease is. So th there's no question that masking is more important, and that even though you yes. touch a mask, we don't like it, right. but it doesn't make it worse than wearing a mask. That is just a wives' tale, old wives' tale. Sorry, that sounds sexist. I should say All right, say we're going to dive into these <laughs> questions. The context of the first one is all week yeah. we've been talking about more people on the ventilators. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what are the underlying conditions that are predictors of more serious illness with COVID-19, are there? There clearly are a lot of the are. underlying diseases, yeah. and, and, and it's hard to know, and it's not just the disease, it's how severely you're affected by the disease. Mm -hmm. And that can include things like diabetes, and you know, clearly if, you're, if your A1C is really high versus really low, which is a marker how well controlled your, diabetic, your diabetes is, um, you're more at risk. And so there's a gradation. If you have uh, COPD or asthma, but your disease is mild, are you more at risk? Yeah, but you're really even more at risk if your disease is severe. Those who have a severe manifestation of any disease are going to be more compromised than those who don't. And so there is a gradation that goes along with that thing. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. Um, we know which ones are more higher risk for progressing to critical illness, and that is, as you talked about, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease. Obesity is also another one. Um, that leads you to have a higher risk of getting um, to critical illness and the ventilator as well. So those are the main ones. Um, you know, is cancer and immune suppression? That is as well. But again, I think to the extent of 
well, how severe is that disease? Yeah. And if you're in your long-term remission from your cancer, then are your cancers, you know, very mild? So I have prostate cancer. It's very mild. I'm supposed to live a very long time, approximately yeah. a very long time with it. Um, and I don't think that my level of prostate cancer puts me at an increased risk for COVID-19. However, if somebody has advanced prostate cancer, advanced breast cancer, under chemotherapy, et cetera, that's a, or radiation therapy, that's a different question. And so I think yeah. it's like, and I think the heart failure patients, so that's a different you know, heart transplant or any form of transplant, you know, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, if you start going on disease modifying therapy, it means you probably have more advanced disease. Mm -hmm. And if you have more advanced disease, you're going to have, be more at risk. So really, it, I don't, we could say, well, what's the list? The list is any underlying disease process yeah. that's more advanced. It's going to make you more compromised because your immune system isn't right in those situations. Right. And to be clear, I have a patient upstairs right now I'm treating on the ventilator. No obesity. No, yeah. No, no diabetes. No disease. Yep. You know, not her, the age is not old, not elderly. So... It happens you know, one thing we should do next week is we have pretty good data and a nice presentation on the deaths here at KU. And I think we need to show that. Uh, we need to show what their d diseases look like. We need to talk about their age distribution. So let's plan to do that next week. We've got a nice slide set. And we'll talk yeah. about who has died at the University of Kansas. And um, um, one of these times we'll get back what the CMOs calls. And, and I think you're going to hear the same message coming from everywhere. All right, this next question is in the context of um, going out, being around people. What is the definition of high exposure, low exposure? Do I need to quarantine after visits with both? Yeah, I think that's up your alley there. I Great do question. You know, the, the second question is the easiest, and the answer is yes. Um, and this is because we know, and there's just been a new um, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association study, that looked at a group from Korea. So Korea did a very good job of identifying contacts and placing all those contacts into a center. So they have a very good data and very good um, uh, cohort of these patients where they had 300 people, um, 100 or so of those didn't have any symptoms when they went into the treatment center. Overall, um, by the end of the study, by the end of two or three weeks, 89, 90 uh, 90 people, 30% of those people had no symptoms whatsoever. So that's the problem. So it's hard to really define high exposure versus low exposure because we don't always know who has it. Obviously, obviously if you know somebody who's sick and you're within six feet, three feet, no mask, that's a very high exposure. But otherwise, low exposure, certainly we can reduce exposure as much as possible, and that is by distancing and both parties wearing a mask. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to define that. Certainly in the healthcare setting, we can define that a little bit easier because we define it by the patient and the healthcare provider. Were both parties wearing a mask? Was there source control? In general, for contact tracing and things of that nature, there's not really a high exposure versus low exposure, um, especially, again, if you don't know somebody's ill. If you are in uh, an area, especially an indoor area, and you are with a lot of people, and there are no masks, that would be essentially a high exposure. Um, but you could still be with just one, one other person and you aren't wearing masks, that could be a high exposure as well. And so I think it really depends on, again, the distancing and the mask wearing to really define um, exposure, high exposure, low exposure. But you can have a very high exposure with one other person that you're having a conversation with if you aren't um, distancing, if you aren't wearing the masks. All right, next question. What happens to our bubbles when school starts? Our yeah. bubbles change, I think, and yep, they collide absolutely. with other bubbles. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's really the, one of the challenges of being back in school is that the bubble you may have been able to construct by keeping, um, uh, keeping yourself safe and keeping your family out of contact with other families is going to be disrupted. And that's what scares people, I think, about going back to school. Yeah. And I, I don't think we really know how successful that's going to be. How do you manage it? The thing you do is what we talk about every day. You make sure your kids wear a mask when they're at school. And there's that video from Georgia uh, when this kid's actually got suspended. I'm not quite sure about that, but the, they yeah. were taking the video of the kids walking in a crowded hallway together, and they're all, you know, what typical high school hallway. Everybody's crowded, and nobody, and nobody had a mask on. Yeah. Like it, was, it looked like it was 2019 almost. And, and you look at that, and you think, you see, that, that's where you get more risk put out there. But if, if people will wear a mask and they try to socially distance and the school's been really thoughtful, I think you can accomplish a higher degree of safety. 
Is it the same as having your bubble at home? Absolutely not. It is not the same. And that's why we say, and that's why we talked about it yesterday, how safe is it? Is it safe enough? And that depends entirely upon your individual risk tolerance. You have to think about what's the health like of the people at home? What's the health like of my kids? Can I have you safe to go in and interact with those other bubbles? And what's the downside if you don't go to school? Does your child go at risk for depression and other things in social isolation and anxiety? So those are the things as parents yeah. that we have to weigh, and then we have to do our best to determine whether or not it's right for our kids to go to school. There is no medically absolute yeah. right or absolute wrong answer. It's a balance of risk that each person has to personally handle on their own. And I think that's part of the personal responsibility, Dana. Yeah, absolutely. We know the bubbles are going to increase. Those children do interact with each other. And this kind of does go also back to the exposure and risk. So the other part to the exposure is um, time and um, proximity to the patient. So not all of the children in the school are going to be close to all the other children. It's going to be hard to know who is a close contact of that children. So you have to assume that that bubble is going to expand. And unfortunately, you don't have control over who that bubble expands with and to what extent. And so that's really um, the big issue here. And that's why it kind of goes back to um, personal preference. But of course, we know there is a tragedy of kids not in school. There um, are reports about children not being able to get their lunches and get those needed meals. But also those um, mandatory reporters not being able to identify abuse and other even, um, not even in schools, but the social workers and the case workers um, for the cities or the communities unable to check up on those high risk kids. And for I think the mental health of that. children. I Absolutely. mean, all those things pull, pour into this equation that every yeah. family has to have a discussion about and try to weigh. And our, our advice is the things that would weigh heavily, and if you came to talk to me as a patient and I was counseling you, and I've counseled some of my patients about this, what, let's look at your personal calculus. How safe is your family? How healthy are you? I take care of a lot of patients with cystic fibrosis. Not a very healthy population. Mm -hmm. That answer is probably different than if I'm having a routine conversation with a patient who needs a routine physical, and it's really a well, not well exam. That's probably a different conversation. And you have to weigh all those factors along with the mental health. Uh, some of my patients have kids whose mental health is challenged by being at home. You know what? Try and get them to wear a mask, wash their hands, socially distance, and hope the school district's putting the right things in effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we had the director of the Kansas, I'm not going to get this right, the organization correct, but the, the, the director of the Kansas High School. Uh, the high school, the Kansas um, High School Athletic Association. There was that person, yes, that and then the schools in general. And they talked about that. It, what, a thousand page guide or whatever yeah. to going back to school. Oh, the yeah. commissioner the, of the Kansas. Yep. Commissioner, Education. thank you. Yes. And I thought Education. did a great job of talking about how they're trying to put the information out there, let parents look at it and make decisions. And I thought it was, you know, it was a very thoughtful and well-reasoned answer. And that's the same thing we're telling people, I think. Your bubbles will be different. They can still be okay, but you have to decide the level of risk. Yeah. All right, next question. Professional sports teams are struggling to stay on the field. How can high schools do fall sports successfully? Yeah, this is um, hard. Right now, this is going to be very difficult to do with the continued spread of the disease. Um, we understand that this goes to the, con the, the question that we just had about the bubbles expanding. Um, that bubble is going to expand qu quite a bit if you are having you know, team sports and and get-togethers for practices and things of that nature. So, you know, as we move forward, it seems like the professional teams can do a very good job in a bubble. They have the money and the resources. For high schools and colleges, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, as we are not seeing any real flattening or decline, any significant flattening or decline in cases right now, I think that's going to be very difficult moving forward. I think it is. So I watched the Royals game last night, or part of the game, did a little World War. 13 to 2 Royals win. Nice job. <laughs> and uh, have the have the cutouts in the field right behind home plates. Patrick Mahomes and and I think uh, uh, Dick Hauser. Some of you will remember the '85 World Series manager and some other players were uh, uh, the in their cutouts. Guys there too. That was awesome. Well, yeah, he wasn't on the one last. <laughs> oh, night. he was. I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. Um, the uh, but it, it was it was great to see and 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 but they're all cutouts and then Fox had put in the kind of the, the sort of pseudo crowd in there mm -hmm. and like okay 
The players are pretty safe. And if you look at the Royals, Vensky was with us. He's a, uh, one of our orthopedic docs who's the team physician for the Royals. And, and he was like, you know what? The Royals are doing it right. Yeah. End of the season, yep. we had, I think, three players who were positive at the start and no player since. Now, the, the Cardinals and the Marlins yeah. didn't fare so well. But if you look at the reason around that, they went out to A, a casino, and B, a bar. Yep. I, I may have those flipped. But the, um, uh, but the point is, they did something that is a known risky activity. So here's the story. You take a sport like tennis and golf, it's going to be a little easier. Yeah. Right? Golf it's going to work. much easier. Even track and field, less contact, you can probably get away with some of that. You take baseball, probably pretty good. You take football and basketball, I think it's going to be a challenge. Absolutely. And I don't know how that's going to go. And, and and I think the best thing you can do is have some program in which the kids are tested, you make sure they're negative, and that the kids have to be socially responsible. Because ultimately, the success of this sport will depend upon, are the coaches and the staff enforcing mask wearing and distancing, and are they talking to the kids? And then, will the kids be responsible? Because... It's not just the practice field. They do whatever they do outside. If they're going to go out to a party or you hang around or do stuff, then all of a sudden they're going to bring that back to the team, and then it's not going to work. It is just not going to work. And so I don't know how well that's going to play out. I have my suspicions it's not going to go great with really large team sports in high school. I'm a little nervous about that. Yeah. Um, and I think basketball, football, maybe volleyball, wrestling, those are going to be hard. I think for the ones where the kids a little more distance, that may well work. I think, I think it's going to rely very dependently, though, on the level of social responsibility of the team, the coaches, the kids, and then uh, the sport and the dynamic of the sport and how close people are. Yeah, and I think the lack of accurate, efficient, cheap testing for the masses is going to play into that as well. Yeah, it is. Okay, headaches, fever, trouble breathing were the frequent symptoms early on. Mm -hmm. What are the most common symptoms now? Yeah, that's great. You know, looking back on the reports, everybody in, in China in those initial reports had fever, cough, shortness of breath. And yeah. if you didn't have it, then you didn't have it. Yeah. Absolutely. Whoops. We they know that's not patients. true. They missed yeah. a lot of people. And I think the disease was so widespread there with a lot of asymptomatic yeah. that they were just overwhelmed. They just were unable to understand that. Certainly we have a lot more information now. So certainly the initial symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Well, we, we find out now that you know maybe 70, 75% of people have fever. Um, a little bit less than that, maybe 65 to 75% have the shortness of breath or cough. So you're looking at a lot of other symptoms and we've called these atypical symptoms. Now there are some typical symptoms of other cough and cold, um, such as sore throat. I don't really think so much runny nose, but certainly sore throat. Um, now, runny nose could still happen, but there are other atypical symptoms, nausea, vomiting. Um, we have seen one of the most um, remarkable ones, 30 to 40 percent of people probably get this, and that's loss of taste or smell as well. So those can be um, some of the more atypical symptoms, again, along with the shortness of breath, cough and fever. Um, and we're still learning more, but those are going to be the most common ones. Of course, muscle aches. Um, and, and malaise or just feeling bad or fatigued is going to be the other two big ones. And I think GI symptoms are also out there, diarrhea yeah. and yeah. Uh, abdominal pain can also be presenting yeah. features. And as you've said, um, sometimes remember you don't have symptoms, yeah. right? There's a lot of asymptomatic transmission or mildly symptomatic. And I think what we really have to remember is that it's still a coronavirus. So everything we just described can be true about the normal coronavirus. Yeah. You know, yes. how many times you have, your cold actually start with a little bit of loose stools, and then a few days later, all of a sudden, you got a runny nose, yeah. or you got a sniffles, and you got a sore throat. What do you have? Oh, you had coronavirus. Base, you know, normal, old-fashioned coronavirus, the one we would all long to get as opposed to COVID, the yeah. one that causes COVID-19. So um, it, 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 it's true that pretty much any symptom can be a manifestation, yeah. but some are much more common, as yeah. you've just reviewed. Yeah. Okay, this next question is in the context of the people mm -hmm. that are between the asymptomatic and hospitalized, there's a good number that mm -hmm. are home and they don't feel yeah. well. How long do the debilitating COVID symptoms last? Is this forever? Mm -hmm. This is great. It is a great question. Yeah. Is there, the few things are forever, though, even with COVID. Right. Um, but there was a, a pretty good study out of, um, out of Italy, and this actually did look at people with mild to moderate disease. 
and it showed that you can have some of these symptoms up to 60 days, and I'm sure it can progress even longer than that. Um, I, I think we don't know exactly how long, and I think every person is going to be different, but muscle aches or some shortness of breath or some cough can probably last weeks to a couple months, um, and I think it just depends on, on the person, but we know those symptoms can last um, certainly after you get over the acute infection. I think people do get better. That's the key. Yeah. And I had a, we had that conversation with someone yesterday. Um, you know, influenza uh, can often make you feel sick for three to six months. If you have mm -hmm. severe influenza, uh, even without being in the ICU, and if you get in the ICU, the, 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 the recovery can be six to 12 months, but that's an ICU critical illness. Yeah. Um, but influenza can leave you sick for a long time. I, I had influenza in January for my 60th birthday. That was my birthday gift was a round of influenza. I didn't really feel good for about three months. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true with this severe coronavirus or any severe viral, viral infection. It's not limited to COVID-19. Any viral illness that you get can make you sick for a while. If you get RSV, if you get yeah. metanumavirus, parainfluenza, influenza, any of those can make you feel sick for three to six months. So don't be surprised if you've had COVID-19 that you yeah. don't feel good for a while. Yeah. And the sicker you are, the longer the recovery. In general, that's true. Not 100%, but in general, that's true. And again, if you've been on a ventilator in the ICU, your recovery is more likely yeah. to be six to 12 months. And if you are, if you do have COVID and you are ill, you know, we understand that people who don't even have symptoms have changes with their lungs when they looked at under CAT scan. If you have that inflammatory process going on, you are probably not gonna be having good air exchange anyways, and so you're probably gonna be short of breath. We know that for regular cough and cold, the regular coronaviruses, the metanumavirus, the rhinovirus, you can have cough for two or three weeks later. So right, up to six to eight weeks later. Yeah. How many chronic coughs do I see in the clinic in which the real answer was, well, I had a cold a little while ago. Yeah. Well, okay, give yourself 12 weeks, come back if the cough. And people want that to go right away. They think mm -hmm. they should just be better like that. That's just not how it works, and we can all want that. But that yep. is not how it works. And you may stay sick for quite a while, so don't be frustrated by that as long as you're continuing to get better. And one of the, the comments we hear a lot is, well, I don't really feel better. Okay, well, how, how do you feel compared to two weeks ago? Well, I'm better than that. Okay, well, mm -hmm. you're getting better. You're just not going to notice it all at once. And, and that's frustrating to folks. They want to be better all at once. They want to be through it. They want to be normal. As long as your ship is steering in the direction of improvement and you can continue to show improvement over time, you're sailing the right way, and that means you'll eventually get there. But it can take three to six months. Next question. How soon after feeling symptoms should I get a test? Yeah, great question. Sooner is better than later. I agree, 100%. So we understand that um, you probably are producing or replicating the most virus one to two days prior to symptoms and one to two days after symptoms start. So after that, the vir for most people, the viral replication will start to go down. So you will probably have the highest chance of having an accurate diagnosis probably as soon as your symptoms start, certainly within a day. Um, that doesn't mean that if you were tested four or five days later, it wouldn't be positive. But I think more on for your knowledge and for the safety of others around you, it's probably best to get a test as soon as you start having symptoms. Time for one more question, I think, Jill. Okay, how accurate are rapid COVID-19 tests? Mm -hmm. And we have people asking about saliva tests too. Yeah. You know, we talked about this yesterday, Dan. Yeah. I think we said that the nasal swab is still the gold standard until we, yeah. until we get a little bit further along. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have to say that's the gold standard. But when you're doing mass testing, we're using the saliva test in Lawrence. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the sports team are using it as a screening tool. It's still pretty darn accurate. We're going to have a whole session devoted to that uh, in the next week or so, yeah. um, because I keep making a lot of promises about the next week or so, Jill. So we've been <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's right. There's a long I'm list. With you, no problem. I'm on a long list. Um, but I, I think that what we know is that if if the no, normal nasal swab is 99% sensitive or yeah. specific, that saliva is about 96, 97%. percent yeah. And in some studies, almost almost exactly as good as a swab. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a fairly recent publication that compared. It was a meta now. So it compared a lot of journal articles with each other, and it looked at nasopharyngeal or MP swab, sputum, and oropharyngeal swab. And what it did show was that sputum, so sputum is kind of what you cough up. A lot of that is probably saliva for a lot of people. Um, that was almost more accurate 
than even an NP swab as far as detection. So there is good data to suggest that maybe the sputum or the saliva is more accurate, but I think we still need more studies. But to your point, it's probably about the same. So that's very good. How accurate are the, um, the rapid tests? I think it depends what rapid test you're talking about. Are you talking about a rapid PCR test? which we know the PCR tests are the gold standard, and they are typically very sensitive, or is it the antigen test? I think for the antigen test, it's probably not right now where it needs to be, but hopefully we can move to that um, in the near future. And I think that also depends on the overall prevalence of the disease in the community, as well as the amount of virus you're replicating. So there are a lot of factors in that. And right now, the rapid tests are not um, you know, fully out into the community. But certainly, um, they are getting more and more. I think Abbott has a rapid PCR test. Um, I think um, you know that may be. And again, overall, the PCR tests are probably going to be more sensitive than the antigen test. And this is going to look a lot different a year from now than it does yes. today. So um, Monday is our hundredth episode of this media program, and I'm not sure you or I ever thought we were going to have this kind of a, a mm -hmm. career. COVID does funny things to all of us. I'm not sure Jill ever thought she'd have to corral the two of us on a regular basis. Right. That's a little work. I just got to say uh, that. It's a joy. You're a joy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I don't think what she said. How many times have you been with us here trying to do our <laughs> sign and interpretation, Michelle. huh, Michelle? A lot. So 100th episode, Tom Bell will be with us. He's the president and CEO of the Kansas Hospital Association and Herb Kuhn, who's president and CEO of the Missouri Hospital Association. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. What a great conversation, yeah. great folks. I got a bunch of wrap-up points. What do you got? You know, we're moving into the weekend. We are very happy that our hospitalizations are down. We understand hospitalizations do lag behind new cases. There are still lots of new cases that are diagnosed every day. Uh, we really want people to continue to wear the masks, do the physical distancing, don't gather in large groups, really to really stop, decrease the spread of this disease, flatten that curve or decrease it so that we can start to get our kids back to school in a safe manner to keep the kids safe, to keep their bubbles safe, to keep the teachers, the counselors and the other administrators and everybody else safe. Yep. And then there is some breaking science out there. Yeah. We noticed that uh, a lot of people think they, they can wear a mask below the nose, but breaking science below the nose community has been stunned as a study has shown that the nose is connected to the lungs. Indeed, <laughs> it demonstrates that in this breaking science, it is published by the National Institute for Understanding Basic Anatomy, shocked the world, showing that the discovery in humans, the nose is actually attached to the lung. It's all part of the airway. This revelation dealt a stunning blow to the community who wear COVID masks below the nose. And I think, yes. Dana, we're going to be back in the freezer next week demonstrating yeah. that how the nose knows. That is, the nose knows it doesn't work. Some mask-wearing pictures this morning. These look awesome because we know we're trying to keep talking about how important it is for us to get yeah. the masks on and make sure we keep wearing them. I'm going to finish some more stuff about that in just a minute. Brian and Rita sent us this picture along with a thank you note for doing these updates. We are the ones to thank you for helping us be the pillars of infection control. Like and thanks problem. to yeah, it does. And thank you, Rhonda, for setting in a photo of her husband. <laughs> Rhonda writes, Bill is an essential worker in HVAC, and this is his new favorite mask. Quoting wise words from Yoda, and Les, I do love Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Too close you are. It's like Baby Yoda. It does look like Baby Yoda. Hey, we want to see that you're staying safe. Please send us these photos to the Facebook Messenger at KU Hospital or email them to Medical News Network at KUMC.edu. Um, we so appreciate being with you every day. A couple of last thoughts. First, we have a video because Sonny says something important to us. You remember Sonny? If you don't, you're about to learn more. Hi friends, I'm Sonny. And Sonny says to keep your distance and stay six feet apart. Practice by playing games six feet away so you know what it looks like. I got you. Try noodle tag. Catch ya. Six foot volley. Use hand sanitizer for this one. Buster Rhyme. Cat. Match. Stand six feet apart in a circle. Pick a word and start a rhyme chain. Fat. Nat. Hat. If you get stuck, it's five jumping jacks. Four. Five. Find creative ways 
to measure six feet. Like how many Barbies make six feet? How many crayons? How many Uno cards? And how many little brothers? Sunny says it's okay to tell your friends to keep their distance. Come up with a different way to hug and high five with your friends. Try a wave or a peace sign. Maybe a silly word or phrase. Pan dance. Banana sandwich. It means we can't be close, but you're still my friend. Sunny says, remember who's in your bubble. I love my brother. Hi, Stinker. But wouldn't mind a little distance. But he's in my bubble, so I can give him some love. Remember, Sunny says, it's smart to stay six feet apart. And for all of us Trekkies out there, it's live long and prosper. Just saying, <laughs> that's the right way to do it. it. Hey, we're going to remind you about this mask. We got our mask. We did a show from the freezer last time. And, and uh, I just want to remind us all that um, whereas we have a lot of freedom in this country, which is a marvelous thing, and travel a lot of places and go fly fishing in great spots and not have to worry about, you know, the freedom is, about, freedom is awesome. Right. But it's not absolute freedom. It's freedom with responsibility. You can't drive 100 miles an hour down a crowded street because you could hurt somebody. You can't catch a building on fire because you could hurt somebody. It's freedom with responsibility. Wearing a mask right now in this pandemic, it's our responsibility to each other to keep our community safe. Think about it like that. And until we see you next week, remember there's still no place like home. Wear a mask and watch this video. We're back in the freezer. I'm here with good old friend Doc Hawk. Hi. How are you? It's cold. It is cold. This is our cool tape measure. What does it show us? Six feet. Let's see how far our breath goes. That was a big breath. It's going six feet. It's getting here. Now on normal breath, we were just talking, probably about three feet. There's the tape measure just to be showing you how far it goes. Now we're going to put a mask on. Let's see what happens. Can we keep each other safer? Let's take our deep breath. Man, I just saw a little breath go out a couple of inches. How about you? Yep, not too far at all. All right, a couple of easy breaths. Even just talking, nothing. Nothing's going on. Once again, masks keep you safe. But let's see what happens when we put on a cloth mask. Can we take a deep breath and try it again? I don't know you about you, but my glass is totally fogged up. I just get fogged. I yeah, don't see breath. I don't see the breath either. Pretty awesome. Let's see what happens when we try it with a face shield. Face shield on. Where does my breath go? Uh oh, I'm seeing a little more coming out, Dana. How about you? I think it's coming out below. That's the problem with the face shield. It just goes down, still gets into the air. And when you stand here and you breathe, pretty soon. I create a little breath cloud all around me. And then other people walk through my breath cloud. That's why masking is so important because Doc Hawk, he doesn't create the breath cloud with the cheese mask on. Nothing. It's awesome. So you know how to stay safe? Do the thing we've been doing in the operating room for generations. It helps keep you safe there. It helps keep you safe on the streets and in your home and everywhere you go. Wash your hands. Keep your distance, six feet, there it is. Make sure you wear a mask. Keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, keep all of us safe. We can do it together.